going from January until October to get somebody talking face to face with the Iranians. Now that's a mark of how much, how much in the way of impedimenta stands in, in the way of a president doing what he promises to do when it has to do with something that Israel doesn't like. So what happened? Well, he sent the Deputy Secretary of State uh, to Geneva to meet together with the five plus one, the European for the Security Council people plus Germany, with the top Iranian negotiator. And they were very clever. The West, so to speak, had uh, devised this, this proposal that they kind of knew Iran could not possibly accept. The proposal was, look, we're really concerned about this low enriched uranium you have in Iran. Now, most of you will know that to get high enriched uranium, make a bomb, you have to start with low enriched uranium, okay? Right. So they said, we're concerned about this low enriched uranium, and so our proposal is that you ship out three quarters to two thirds of that low enriched uranium out of your control out to Turkey, Russia, or France, and we will process it uh, from 5% up or 3% up to 20%, which is what you say you need for your medical reactor. Now, these are medical isotopes. Some of you probably, like me, know about C scans and, and other kinds of scans. Uh, I'm a recovering cancer patient myself. I'd hate to be in a place that didn't have the capability that reassured me that it's not come back, okay? So I have sort of a personal interest in this. Anyhow, they needed they needed uranium enriched to 20%. Now, from 3 or 5% to 20% is most of the way to 90%, believe it or not. That's what the experts tell me. It's not, you know, it's not a arithmetical sort of thing. When you get to 20%, then it's a lot easier to go the rest of the distance. So they wanted to get that 20% back to the nuclear medicine reactor, but out of the uranium's control. So, the top Iranian uh, Delegate said, uh, sounds good to me. Yeah, we agree in principle. <laughs> and after the Westerners got off the floor, they said, really? He said, yeah, I'll go back to Tehran and I'll discuss this with my, with my people. And uh, let's go back. And they decided to go back to Vienna on the 19th of October. So just two and a half weeks later. So there was some momentum there. Guess what the New York Times said? Wow, if this is real, we're not going to have to worry about Iranian weapons anymore. The New York Times, okay? A lot of us were really buoyed up uh, in these weeks thinking, my goodness, finally there's been a break in this situation. Guess what happened? There's a, uh, a terrorist group called Jandala. It operates in the fringes of the country of Iran. It's been formed, financed, led by Israeli, U.S., and sometimes Pakistani intelligence services. And some, by some strange way, they got access to incredibly accurate information on a meeting of about 25 very senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard generals with their retinue. Okay, it was out in, uh, in the provinces. And they killed them. They killed five of those generals and uh, wounded many others. And uh, they did that on the 18th of October, 2009. Okay? The day before the, the negotiations were to resume in Vienna. Now, the Revolutionary Guard folks report to the Supreme Leader, Khamenei. He's their patron and they report directly to him. And I don't know this for sure, but I think it's a fair inference that the head of the Revolutionary Guards went and said, uh, Supreme Leader, uh, are you gonna trust these guys? Look what they just did. Look what they just did. And the five of my generals, including the Deputy Commander of the Ground Forces, you can't trust these guys. And that plus some, some dissension within the government in Iran with respect to whether we really should give away this much uh, caused the negotiations to founder. Uh, Iran, Iran did send somebody to Vienna, but uh, they backtracked on some of the main provisions. So that's what happened to that. Now, am I saying that the Israelis didn't want that agreement? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. 
Does that mean the Israelis are not afraid of a nuclear weapon in Iran's hands? It means to me, at least, that they know that nowhere near to getting one, and if and when they get one, uh, they will be deterred by the 300 or so uh, nuclear weapons that Israel has. Um, let me interject here. There is one sense in which um, that we have to take seriously uh, that the, the, the Israelis could be concerned about this. And that is this. Uh, you know, up until now, if the Israelis wanted to uh, hit out against Gaza or Syria or Lebanon, you name it, uh, you know, they just did. And they didn't worry about looking behind their shoulder. There's nobody really to, the U.S. is going to say, well, maybe you shouldn't have done that. But they always think, the Israelis, that it's better to, you know, ask for forgiveness rather than permission. So they just do these things, okay? Now, if Iran had just one or two uh, nuclear weapons, uh, the Israelis would, would really have to look behind their shoulder. And, and if the Iranians made so bold as to say, you know, we really don't like you messing up Hezbollah or Hamas, uh, then the Israelis would have to think twice. Think twice. They do it anyway, I'm, I'm sure, because of the uh, comparative strength they enjoy. But thinking twice is something they've had to do before. So I think that's the, that's the only respect in which the Israelis are, are, are genuinely concerned about the Iranians getting a nuclear weapon. Um, so what's the, what do the Israelis really want? And we, by extension, seem, since we're sort of walking, as the president described it, in lockstep with the Israelis. You all know what lockstep is? Lock step is? Do you know where it comes from? Any American historians here? In the late, in the late 19th century, 19th century? After the Civil War, whatever century that was, uh, the penal code uh, prescribed a procedure where prisoners would have a ball on their left ankle chain here, and they'd have to grab onto the right shoulder of the person before them, and they would take a high step with their right and drag the ball. It was a ball and chain. That's lockstep, folks, okay? Now, that was the image that our president used, I think it was on Super Bowl Sunday, to say, we're marching in lockstep with Israel. Now, we also said, before APAC, I, he likes to say I, have you noticed? I've got Israel's back. Okay. Now, I don't think it's unfair to put the two images together. If you're marching in lockstep and you've got Israel's back, who's leading? Let's just go back to the negotiations. The ones in late 2009 failed. For the reasons I adduced, I believe that's right. Now they started again the following spring. At our initiative, not really, because uh, Obama was not real happy with uh, what happened and whether he, uh, whether he knew about what Jamal was going to do or not. Uh, it was a good excuse just to kind of say, well, maybe we what not to negotiate. Maybe these are very bad people after all. But you know what? Two of the upcoming uh, countries in this world, Turkey and Brazil, decided, as they put it, we don't want another Iraq. We do not want another attack on a, on a country because they are presumed to have nuclear weapons. And so they both went to the White House and they said, we're gonna make another try here with Ahmadinejad. Uh, we know you think he's an evil guy, but we think we can talk to him. And they got permission, okay? They got encouragement from the President of the United States. They went off to Tehran, to, yeah, to Iraq, to Tehran, negotiated with the, uh, with the Iranians, and reached a deal. It was the same kind of deal as before, except not three quarters or two thirds, but just half of the low enriched uranium going out of country to be processed at 220%. And some of you may remember the pictures, the pictures not in front of all the papers, 
Rachman Dinejed, sort of a little guy, uh, De Silva from Brazil, Erdogan from Turkey, and they got their hands together and said, we did it, we did it, we got the agreement, okay? Now what happened next? What happened next was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton got up the next day and said, here is our response to that agreement. Sanctions, strong sanctions. We've got China and the Soviet Union <laughs> and Russia together on this now, and uh, so we're gonna do hard sanctions. Now, what did the Turks and the, uh, and the Brazilians do? They said, who's running this country? Who's running your country? And De Silva had the guts to give the letter that he received from Barack Obama to the Brazilian press, where Barack Obama suggests exactly the kind of accord that De Silva and Erdogan had worked out with uh, with Ahmadinejad and the rest of the Iranians. So that's the history of all this. Uh, 2009 first one I described, 2010, and now we're finally at the point where we're negotiating again. There seemed to be some, uh, some progress when the head of the IAEA was really our man, okay? Do you remember, the, remember his predecessor? What was his name? Baradai. Baradai, yeah. Tough cookie, wasn't he? I remember when I was watching it live on TV when he went before the Security Council before the attack on Iran, and he talked about the, uh, uh, the, the, the documents on yellow cake uranium coming from Africa, I remember? I remember him saying, we have looked at these documents now and have an have a, a independent group looking at them, and we have determined that they are not authentic. Forgeries. Not to authentic, it's I guess diplomatic language. He was tough, they tried very hard to get rid of him, the US did, and now we have our own man in there. His name is Amano, he's a Japanese diplomat. How do we know he's our own man? WikiLeaks! Some of the WikiLeaks cables show that we were putting the arm on all the other voters to vote for Amano, that Amano in turn was thanking our diplomats in Vienna for all the good offices that they're performing and saying, you know, I could use a little bit more funding here for, for my office and getting it, okay? And so Amano is in no, in no sense an independent uh, head of the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. And yet, was it two, three weeks ago, he went to, uh, to uh, Iran and came back saying, you know, they're willing to, to accept the kind of inspection regime that uh, we think is necessary. So we're working something out with them. And just a few days later, the negotiators met. And what were our terms that we offered to Tehran? Anybody know? Shout out. Uh, there were three of them, really. I'll give you a hint. They're the ones that, uh, I was going to say Ariel Sharon, <laughs> but it's not Ariel Sharon. I wonder if he's still, still around. Uh, uh, so, uh, who was the, you know, Bibi Netanyahu, uh, a couple of days before it was revealed what the terms were, said, look, they have to ship out all their, all their low enriched uranium and the 20% now. They have to close down Parcham, which is the major underground uh, processing plant. And they have to agree uh, never to process uh, uranium again. No, no, and, uh, and so those turned out to be the terms that we offered uh, Iran. Now, it's a very compelling argument that we, that we give. Iran, you've got to close down that underground facility because it's a provocation. I mean, it's getting near the point where the Israelis can't attack it anymore. So that's really, really a provocation. So you better close it down altogether. Now the Iranians are never gonna do that. So I don't know what's gonna happen in, in the negotiations, but I think what the American people need to know is the full story about these things. A, that Iran is not working on a nuclear weapon, although most Americans believe they are. Most Americans believe, according to the latest poll, it's two years old now, that Iran already has a nuclear weapon. What was that 70%? 70. 
And that's the same percentage that thought that Saddam Hussein was working on a nuclear weapon. So at least we're consistent. <laughs> so um, well, let me just uh, not carry on too much longer here. Let's see what else I wanted to. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, so I, I told you about Jun Bolo. And, uh, you know, in thinking through what's been going on, um, I think it's really worth noting that we not only seem subservient and overly attentive to uh, what the Israelis consider their uh, strategic needs. Many of our policymakers um, really have great difficulty distinguishing between what they perceive to be the strategic needs of Israel on one hand and our own strategic needs on the other. But you know, it's even tactically true. Well, where did we learn this uh, targeted assassination business? When we learn uh, to uh, wrap people up without uh, charge or, or, uh, or judicial process, I mean, it's sort of like uh, a, a ditto thing. Um, and these things have incredibly deleterious consequences. Now, let me refer you just to one little incident that you probably remember the beginning of. Remember in, uh, in 2004, when those four contractors, uh, the Blackwater types, they were going around Fallujah, they took a wrong turn, and they ended up uh, being assaulted, uh, really criminally uh, attacked, and uh, some of them hung up from a bridge. Do you remember that incident? It was very much in, in all the newspapers. Most people think that that was the first, first step in this chain of reprisals, but it was the second. Nine days earlier, an old, blind, wheelchaired Sheikh Yassin, the head cleric, Muslim cleric in Gaza, was target assassinated by the Israelis. Now, that was Gaza. We're talking Fallujah, that's in Iraq, right, Ray? Yeah, right, but you know what? on the windows of the cars and trucks that were dragging these four blackwater types to the bridge were signs, the Sheikh Yassin Revenge Corps. Mm -hmm. In most of the windows in Fallujah, there were signs, we will avenge you, Sheikh Yassin. Now the rest of the story is even worse. You'll recall that uh, uh, George Bush we're talking April, May of 2004. Uh, he, was, uh, he was determined to wreak what most people would call collective punishment on Fallujah for what those, it's a big city, what those folks did. And so he sent the Marines into Fallujah, but it was a haphazard sort of thing, and Marine General Conway complained later that, you know, you can't order us into a city and then wait a week and then order us back. I lost five Marines in this, okay? Very unusual for a Marine commander to say that kind of thing. Why did they pull him back? Because the election was coming up, George Bush's re-election, and he didn't want a lot, of, uh, a lot of hostilities out there before the election. What happened the week after the election? They dressed in, they dressed in Fallujah, not only with the conventional artillery, but with stuff containing this depleted uranium. And some of you probably know that many of the children being born in Fallujah are horribly deformed. And that has a half-life of many, many, many thousands of years. So what I'm saying here is that when you target assassinate somebody, that may, may seem really great because you did it, right? And you did it with sophisticated uh, technology and nobody got hurt except except this poor slob, right, okay? And uh, you know, you're oblivious to the consequences. And all I have to say is that since it's been known for 10 days now that our president sits on Tuesday, uh, Tuesdays to review the Tuesday list of candidates, they call them nominations, <laughs> nominations for being killed. And he goes through that, he says, I, I number one, and I'm, uh, number two, he's got children, right? Yeah, let's do two, 
Let's, let's talk about two. We'll do one and three and then we'll move four and five up for next week. Give me a break. Give me a break, you know? And uh, I, was, uh, I was really taken with the way Scott Shane and Joe Becker, who wrote this article, really, really informative article in the New York Times, I think it's the 29th of, uh, of May, how they said, no, this posed a, a, a legal and moral dilemma. Um, how could you align targeted assassinations with American values? Well, hello, that's not, that's not a dilemma. That's an impossibility. Targeted assassination without charge, without judicial process, including those of Americans. Uh, Al Alaki, the fellow from New Mexico, the, the uh, clergy uh, clerk. Uh, the president brags that uh, that was easy. That one was easy. American citizen, that one was easy. So I guess I just have to say that uh, in, this, in this Commonwealth of Virginia, where I've felt very much at home for the last 49 years, being a reject from the Bronx, I've come to really be proud of the heritage here. Uh, learned a good bit about James Madison, George Mason. George Mason lived around the block from where I live. I asked about George Mason, you know, I was speaking actually at George Mason University, so I did a little research. I said, now, I know that Madison went to William and Mary, because four of my kids went to UVA, but one went to William and Mary, so he's always saying, well, you know, where did Jefferson go? Or where did Madison go? They went to William and Mary, right? So I said, I wonder where George Mason went. But you know what? He didn't go anywhere. He was the first homeschooled Virginian. His father died in a swimming accident in the Potomac, and George Mason spent his youth in his father's library, wrote all manner of philosophy, theology, political psychology, and all these kinds of books existed. He was a self-taught person. I suppose this helped him. But when I learned about how the Constitution had been written by these